À, tiếp theo thì chúng ta sẽ nghe một cái bài trình bày à, lại liên quan chi tiết hơn nữa đối với à, phân loại phương, phân loại xe à, phân loại phương tiện à, đối như thế nào thì chúng ta sẽ à, nghe bài trình bày của tiến à, sĩ Christian à, Rodriguez Santis à, ông là kỹ sư à, tương đồng đối với các cái dự án do y đa tài trợ và quản lý ở Tây Ban Nha cũng như cung cấp các cái hỗ trợ và chuyên môn cho hơn 20 văn phòng của công ty à, và ông cũng đã cung cấp các cái dịch vụ cho cái sự là tương đồng về mặt tiêu chuẩn trên toàn thế giới à, bao gồm châu Âu, Hoa Kỳ hay Trung Quốc, Úc, Ấn Độ, Đài Bắc Trung Hoa và trong đấy thì có cả Việt Nam nữa Thế thì là à, bài tiếp theo thì chúng ta sẽ nghe cái bài trình bày của ông à, For the next uh, presentation Uh, I would like to invite the uh, Dr. Uh, Christian Rodriguez Santis uh, to have a presentation on the type, typology of the vehicle, vehicle classification, and European home homologation. Uh, Christian uh, Rodriguez Santis, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and I am very happy to be here presenting. Uh, well, the requirements and the classification for Europe. So let's see the, the presentation. I also apologize for presenting this in English because my level of Vietnamese is really poor, but the next time I, I will try to improve a little bit. Okay, so, uh, well, I, I am focused on L category vehicles, uh, probably some of the attendants uh, know me because we were in Cocta to approve the, the mopeds or, or motorcycles for, for Europe. So the idea is to make uh, or give a brief summary about the European regulation because it's, uh, from my point of view, it's the most complex uh, procedure around the world uh, in terms of vehicle classification and also in technical requirements. Okay, so please, next slide. Okay, so the presentation is uh, divided in three different parts. The first one is only a brief idea about the typology of vehicles that we are talking. The next one is the vehicle classification. Sorry if this part is a little bit boring but I think that it's needed to understand exactly uh, the typologies and the different technical requirements that are, are applicable for the vehicles depending on the categories, subcategories, and sub-subcategories. And then the final part is an introduction about the different steps in order to obtain the European homologation. So, um, as you probably know, um, in order to obtain the European approval, it's necessary to conduct the, uh, the test uh, with uh, an accredited technical service. In this case, uh, I am working with IADA. IADA is an accredited technical service by the Spanish and the Dutch ministry. And no, no, sorry, the previous one. The previous slide, please, this one. Okay, and uh, finally, the the, the approval authority will issue a certificate and you can send you can sell the vehicles around the europe and the most important thing is this european homologation is also accepted in other countries out of europe for example in well, let's see um, vietnam no but in taiwan uh, in the gulf countries and so on uh, I will focus my presentation a little bit in the electric vehicles because the urban mobility is growing uh, time to time. And in fact, uh, during the last years, we only had three, four complete uh, European approvals regarding quadricycles. And at this moment, for example, we are working with more than 14 projects at the same time. They are in a different steps, uh, some at the beginning and uh, the other ones we are conducting the, the test in order to obtain the European homologation. Uh, but as you can see, we have a 
very big business here, uh, here in Europe regarding the electric mobility. So regarding the typo uh, typology of vehicles, you can see in this slide the very different uh, vehicles that we have inside the European regulation. Uh, from bicycles powered assisted uh, to quadricycles for carriage of goods or, or, or people. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we we enter in the vehicle classification. This is the uh, boring part, but it's the most important in order to classify the vehicle and finally select the technical requirements that are applicable. So the first one is the L1 category. The L1 category is divided in two different subcategories, L1A and L1B. So the main idea for the L1, two wheels, uh, and there is an exception for the L1A category. Engine capacity in case of combustion engines less than 15 uh, cc, uh, for only for positive ignition combustion and maximum speed less than 45 kilometers per hour. This is important because in other countries to be classified as L1 category, the maximum speed is less than 50 kilometers per hour. In Europe it's considered up to 45. And then the maximum continuous rate of net power must be less than four kilowatts. Uh, the difference of the two different subcategories are the L1A, it's a cycle design to pedal with an auxiliary propulsion with the primary M28 pedaling. Uh, the assistance must be cut off when uh, 25 kilometers per hour is reached. The maximum continuous rate of net power must be less than one kilowatt. And if the vehicle has three or four wheels and met the um, previous requirements can be classified or well, can be no, must be classified as L1A category. All the other vehicles that cannot be classified as L1A must be L1EB. Next slide, please. The L1 is like a moped tricycle, so vehicle with three wheels, engine capacity less than uh, 50 cc for positive ignition or 500 cc for uh, compression ignition, so in case of diesel engines. Maximum speed less than 45 kilometers per hour, maximum continuous rated power or not power less than four kilowatts, machine run in order without batteries. This is really important for Europe, for the classification. The machine run in order is considered always without batteries, less than 270 kil uh, kilos, a maximum of two sitting positions. So here, uh, again, two different subcategories, L2U and L2P. Subcategory U, uh, only for carriage of goods. Uh, the loading area must fulfill with one of these two requirements. So the length per width, uh, well, this formula, and the equivalent load bed area, uh, the load in the bed area, and the loaded uh, bed shall be able to carry out a minimum volume, uh, etc. Okay, so one of these two options. If the loading area mm, doesn't fulfill with these requirements, the vehicle, in this case, it's an L2EP category, subcategory, sorry. Next slide, please. So now we enter in uh, the motorcycle sector. Uh, L3. The, for the L3 category, we have three different subcategories, depending basically on the engine capacity, power, or the power weight, uh, weight ratio. So in case of L3EA1, the engine capacity must be less than 125 cc's. Maximum continuous rated power less than uh, 11 kilowatts and the power weight ratio, important weight 
it's considered without batteries less than uh, 0.1 kilowatts. For the L3A2, different numbers, but the idea is exactly the same. And the L3A3, it's uh, the most powerful motorcycle, let's say. So it's a motorcycle that cannot be classified as L3A1 or L3A2. Next slide, please. Okay, and now there are um, two different or two um, exceptions for the L3 vehicles, which are the Enduro and Trial. Due to the, um, they are not the, the, the most important product for Europe, the, some requirements are less stringent for these uh, subcategories. And to be classified as Enduro, the specifications are the seat height must be more than 900 millimeters, minimum ground clearance more than 300 millimeters, the overall ratio in the highest gear must be more than six, this is really important. Now, the machine running order plus batteries, less than 140 kilos, and only one sitting position. So in those cases that the vehicle has the position for the driver and passenger cannot be classified as enduro. Uh, the most important aspect for the enduro vehicles, it's, uh, it's not mandatory to fit the vehicles with an ABS system. So for that reason, if uh, you have more than one sitting position, and cannot be classified as enduro, the bike must be fitted with an ABS or a combined brake system, depends on the subcategory. And in case of trial vehicles, uh, seat height less than 700 millimeters, minimum ground clearance more than 280 millimeters, overall ratio in the heaviest year more than uh, 7.5, machine rain order without batteries less than 100 kilos, only one sitting position, and in case of combustion engines, uh, fuel tank capacity less than 4 liters. Uh, for electric vehicles, there is no requirements about the battery capacity in case of trial vehicles. So next slide, please. And now the classification for L4, that uh, the concept is a motorcycle with a sidecar. So the base vehicle, which is an L1, and sorry, an L3, must meet with the requirements, with the technical requirements for uh, the category L3. Uh, it's a base vehicle, an L3, equipped with a sidecar, maximum four seating positions, and maximum of two sitting positions in the sidecar. Okay, so let's continue. And now we will increase the number of wheels and let's enter with the L5. L5, it's, it's a three-wheel vehicle that cannot be classified as L2, uh, either for the power or the maximum speed. The machine going in order without batteries must be less than 1,000 kilos. And, well, as I said, vehicle that cannot be classified as L2 category. And for the L5, we have, again, two different subcategories. L5 EB, basically designed uh, for carriage of goods. And the L5 EA, uh, basically designed for, um, well, destined for, per, uh, for people. Okay, uh, the um, most important here is the L5EA. Uh, the maximum uh, sitting positions are limited to five. Okay, so next. And now uh, let's enter in the quadricycle world. This is a really complex week because here we have categories, subcategories, and sub-subcategories. So as you can see, um, 
we have a very like uh, a tree for the classification and depends on the categories, subcategories and subcategories, sub there are different technical requirements applicable. So to be, uh, to, well, uh, if the vehicle mass uh, is within the L6 E category must met with uh, the following requirements, we call with four wheels, maximum speed less than 45 kilometers per hour, mass in running order without batteries less than 425 kil uh, kilograms, maximum of two sitting positions, really important, because otherwise it's an L7 category, and were requirements for the engine capacity in case of uh, combustion engines. And then different subcategories. Let's start with the L6EA. That, uh, while well, the most important, it's the maximum continuous rate of net power less than four kilowatts and cannot be classified as L6EV. And then, well, for the L6EV, there are two different subcategories, sub subcategories, depending on the if the vehicle is designated for the garage of goods. Or, or people. Okay, so next slide. And the same idea for the L7. So the, the general standard for the, class, uh, for the L7 classification is vehicle for, with four wheels. Mass in rolling order is divided if the vehicle is intended for uh, transport of passengers or goods. Uh, and then there are different subcategories and so subcategories as you can see in this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the subcategory sub L7EA, uh, it's only vehicle designated for the transport of passengers maximum power less than 40, uh, 15 kilowatts and vehicles not complying with the, all, uh, the other two subcategories, B and C. A1, two uh, straddle positions fitted with handlebar and A2 not complying with the A1 classification and maximum two not straddle sitting positions. Next, please. Subcategory B, a uh, requirement regarding the min minimum ground clearance, which must be more than 180 millimeters, um, vehicles not complying with the L7 EC criteria. Subcategory B1 and B2. Well, I will not enter more in detail because you have all the information here in the slide, and I know that this is a really boring explanation. So next slide, please. And the same for the L7EC. Uh, the maximum net power limited up to 15 kilowatts, uh, maximum speed not exceeding uh, nine, 90 kilometers per hour, and important in close driving and passenger compartment accessible by maximum three sides. You have here two different images regarding the, the subcategories. So, one is uh, for the um, transport of passengers and the other for the transport of goods. Okay, so next slide. As you can see, the, um, the categorization of L category vehicles in Europe is uh, really divided compared with other countries, which only are L1, L2, L3, L5, 6, and 7. Here we have categories, sub subcategories, and before starting the homologation procedure, it's really important to know the classification because depends on the classification, sub classification, and sub sub classification, the technical requirements are different. So now let's start with the European approval and, uh, sorry, the previous slide. Okay, in order to obtain the European approval, there are three different steps. So the final, well, the, 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 the manufacturer always wants to obtain the certificate, as you can see in the right part of the slide. But in order to obtain this certificate, uh, there are three different steps. So the first one is the administrative procedure. 
Then we have the technical requirements. So I mean the, the testing part. And the last part is the control of conformity of production, the COP. When uh, we have all these three steps, we can submit all the, all the paperwork as a technical service to the approval authority. And the approval authority will issue the European approval certificate. Okay, next slide, please. So in case of technical requirements, uh, as you probably know, the regulation for Europe, it's the regulation 168 slash 2013. And in this regulation, you can find the classification and uh, all the applicable technical requirements, but without any detail. So the detail are, um, let's say the regulation 168 is amended or, or complemented by three different acts, which are the regulation 3, 2014, regulation 44, 2014, and the regulation 134, 2014. The regulation 3, 2014 is based on the functional safety requirements. For example, here is the uh, our detail, the requirements regarding the brakes, mirrors, uh, electrical safety, because in Europe it's not still mandatory the regulation 136, the UN regulation 136. There are specific technical requirements only for Europe. Uh, and well, all related with the um, with the safety of the of the vehicle. Then in the regulation 44, you can find the general and construction requirements like the EMC, OBD, which is also applicable in case of electric vehicles, stands, uh, handholds, and so on. And finally, the environmental and proportional unit performance. And here you can find the requirements uh, in terms of um, electrical range and consumption and the uh, power and torque measurement. Uh, sorry, I, I will open my, my camera. Sorry, because I was here and I, I realize now. So please, next slide. And now I would like to give some notes about the differences between the combustion engines and the electric vehicles. So the main difference are related with electrical safety. It's uh, half sense that in case of uh, uh, combustion engines, there are no requirements in case of, uh, well, in terms of electrical safety. So the, um, the electrical safety requirements are basically, basically um, focus on uh, requirements against the uh, direct and indirect contact, uh, isolation requirements, uh, requirements regarding the batteries, but not based in the UN regulation 136, as I mentioned before, and you induce safety requirements. That means that, for example, in order to act, uh, activate the, um, the active driving mode, it's necessary to uh, make two deliberate actions, for example. In case of the propulsion unit performance, um, uh, here uh, it's necessary to measure the electric range and consumption, which are the values that the manufacturer must declare for marketing purposes, and the um, maximum continuous uh, rated power, according to the regulation 85. The main difference here is in Europe, it's the regulation 85 uh, forced to me uh, for the measurement during 30 minutes. In Europe, it's also accepted their measurement during only 15 minutes. Okay, next slide, please. And for sure, the most critical part in terms of homologation uh, requirements is the electromagnetic compatibility. Uh, there are verifications uh, with the vehicle in the in char uh, charging mode. And in case of vehicles with onboard charger, you can find here the additional technical prescriptions for those vehicles. 
this is the most important part and under my experience is always the part which um, becomes a delay during the the different approval steps because sometimes the vehicle will not not pass at the first attempt next slide please okay and now let's start with administrative requirements in the delegated act uh, nine, uh, 901 2014 uh, is detailed the preparation of the technical do documentation to be provided to the approval authority. So there is a template that the manufacturer must fill with all the data that the European Commission asks to the manufacturers to provide during the the the, the homologation steps, the different homologation steps. So finally, the, the technical service will send to the, to the approval authority the technical reports with the results of the test and this technical documentation that it's provided by the manufacturer. Then the preparation, no, no, sorry, the preparation of the certificate of conformity that uh, will accompany each produce unit and the uh, the most important here uh, probably it's the WMI which is the wall manufacturing identifier uh, the beam number uh, so that the composition of the beam number there are different parts and the first three digits are the W MI, which is the three digits which identifies the manufacturer. And then regarding the, the administrative requirements under the, well, according to the approval authority, it's necessary to register the manufacturer uh, in the European Union, let's say, and in case of manufacturers of, out of Europe, it's necessary to appoint a legal representative that must be between the European Union. Okay, so next, uh, next slide, please. And finally, we have the control, the control of conformity of production. This is all important because it's part of the, 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 um, the European homologation procedure. So before the testing activities, it's necessary to conduct the initial assessment. The aim of this initial assessment is to verify the capabilities of the manufacturer to produce the vehicles that must be exactly the same as the prototype approved during the homologation procedure. Okay, so it's um, the, the idea of the conformity of production is to ensure that the vehicles that are leaving the production line with the, produ the production has been started are exactly the same or representative, uh, the same, let's say, as the prototype that the technical service uh, has tested and has approved. So for this, we have three different parts. The first one is the initial assessment, so consists in a visit of the, uh, of the production plan and control the uh, quality procedures that the manufacturer will implement once the production will start. Then uh, the technical service will start with the different activities in order to test the vehicle, register the manufacturer uh, in the um, approval authority database and so on. Uh, this is what I explained before. And once the European approval has been granted, uh, there are different periodical audits in order to verify that the production, the, the vehicles that the manufacturer is producing or manufacturing are exactly the same as the vehicle that uh, has been approved in the past. Next slide, please. And well, this is a brief summary. This training usually would take more, more than one week when we provide this training for our customers. So the idea is just to provide a, a general overview 
about the European legislation, the European requirements, and the different steps, the vehicle classification that is really wide and really specific. And for sure, if you have any question uh, here in the presentation, you have my contact. And uh, for sure, your questions are always welcome. And I will be glad um, to support you in the homologation steps, not only for Europe. If you want to investigate another market, for sure, we are always open because we have more than 20 offices around the world. Thank you very much. And now it's time for the questions that I am uh, reading here in the chat. Okay, the main differences about the procedure are exactly the same. So the, the differences are only based on the technical requirements. So in terms of electrical safety, uh, electromagnetic compatibility, uh, energy, and, uh, uh, energy consumption and range, and the power and torque measurement. Then all the other steps are exactly the same. I hope I have solved your question. Um, Ujen, sorry for the pronunciation. Thank, thank you, Christian, for very technical presentation uh, today. So now we open for this question. Uh, các anh các chị à, vừa mới nghe xong bài trình bày của anh Christian về cái cái phân loại phương tiện à, điện này thì không biết có ai có câu hỏi gì nữa thì chúng ta có thể à, giơ tay à, phát biểu để để được thảo luận trực tiếp hoặc là chúng ta có thể à, đưa câu hỏi vào cái cái bục chat một bên cạnh đấy ạ okay for the, for the same countries uh, what is important is to have the partial certificates according to the UN regulations, because in, in some of these countries, uh, they are only asking for this. So the main difference with the European regulation, it's the regulation 136, which is not required for Europe, but is required for the same countries. Okay, then uh, for these countries, it's uh, always the, the importer or the applicant, not the technical service, in this case, IDIADA, who must contact with the different administrations in order to register the, the vehicles and start the business in, the, in these specific countries. Uh, 